and year in Korea. So uh, I would like to start this workshop with extending a very warm welcome to all of you from on behalf of all the co-organizers here. And uh, we hope that you find this workshop enjoyable. Take the free time in between the talks you know, to discuss science. We have kept ample of time in between. And uh, with this quick welcome, I'd like to hand over the floor to our director, Professor Sege Flock, who will quickly introduce the center. So please, Sege. Yeah, just one sec. As, as usual, there's some little problem here, which I, well, okay. I guess I have to figure out the next time. Okay, so welcome everyone. And uh, uh, thanks, Juzar. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, open this uh, workshop, this international workshop on open quantum dynamics and thermodynamics at our center. And what I want to tell uh, to most of you who uh, are maybe not so familiar with uh, who we are is who we are and uh, uh, why we are doing what we are doing. And uh, then uh, well, I will leave this podium uh, to the science. So the Institute for Basic Science is a research organization which was uh, founded, uh, I think now 10 or even more years ago uh, in South Korea. And this organization runs more than 30 uh, research centers Korea wide. And you see here in this, uh, in this map, uh, the locations of uh, most of them. Uh, here's the capital Seoul and a little further more south is Taejong. This is where we are located. And uh, to the bottom right, you see the uh, campus of the headquarters. And this is also where we are located here in this uh, building, uh, which carries the letter B. Uh, the research centers uh, at IBS uh, carry out research in various fields, such as chemistry, mathematics, life sciences, physics, uh, earth sciences, and uh, some other interdisciplinary topics. So when we were founded, uh, we uh, uh, decided to go for finest research and uh, training standards. And uh, we uh, want to, uh, wanted to take the lead and successfully compete in Asia and worldwide. Uh, this we want to do by uh, ensuring strongest research collaborations within our center but also with other IBS centers, in particular with experimental ones, with other top institutions in Korea, Asia, and worldwide. And uh, we set up to uh, serve as a fast track connection for young scientists uh, to be connected quickly and efficiently into the network of truly excellent scientists. And that means that we uh, decided to be a meeting hub for scientists worldwide. And we also offer a research-oriented training program for PhD students. So here you see uh, a snapshot of who we were uh, back in December 2020. We have one department on complex condensed matter uh, theory uh, up and running. And there are some buzzwords on the uh, research topics which we, uh, which we work on. And you can download scientific reports of our activities from our webpage. And you can, of course, contact us anytime for other questions, including also joining us. A little bit on our history. We started on paper in December 2014. Uh, the real scientific activity started in May 2015. In that same year, Heechel Park uh, joined us with the activities of the first junior research team. And in 2016, uh, two more junior research team activities started and uh, were uh, running then, or were led by Ivan Savienko and uh, Ara Go. And Ara in the meantime already left. I will say some more things about that. In 2017, the first IBS Young Scientist Fellow, Daniel Lycom, started his uh, team's activities at our center. 2018, we moved into the new campus, which you have seen from that bird's view. In 2019, Juzar Tingna joined us as another or second IBS Young Scientist Fellow with the activities of his team. Last year, we went successfully through the five-year review. 
And uh, in this year, uh, we already started uh, a new junior research team activity, which is uh, run by Dario Rosa. And then there are lots of uh, green uh, bullets here, which uh, still uh, will be decorated with some news uh, until we reach 2000, early 2023 and our eight year review. Our research themes uh, are listed here. There are lots of buzzwords. Let me say a few of them, topological meta quantum information, uh, many body interactions and transport, light meta interactions in nanostructures, strongly correlated electronic systems, <clears throat> topological uh, photonics, non-equilibrium quantum thermodynamics and quantum chaos in uh, many body systems. Uh, we count currently 38 members, if I did it right, including 11 PhD students. We have 240 publications in a variety of different uh, journals, as you can see here. And uh, the numbers of publications you can also see was rising over the years. So I would say we are performing more or less okay. Uh, and our current age index for those who like these numbers is 27. How do we do that? Uh, we have lots of white and blackboards which uh, we can scribble upon and uh, discuss with each other and we have also a reasonably a reasonable size uh, cluster on which we can uh, perform various computations so this is again the structure of the center you see we have one department on complex condensed matter systems up and running there are two more departments which are supposed uh, to be open in the future uh, we are looking forward to uh, one of them department to uh, to start its activities in the future in the meantime you see here our junior research teams on light matter interaction and nanostructures on quantum chaos in many body systems on quantum many body interactions and transport and on non-equilibrium quantum thermodynamics and the two teams by arago and daniel lycom are now run in associate uh, in associate uh, pcs mode that is the uh, both heads uh, left our center, but are still um, co-running some of the activities of these teams. And everything is glued together by the Science Visitors and Workshop Program, which is uh, uh, coordinated by Jungwan Ryu. And uh, we have here four to five workshops annually, 300 participants annually, one to two advanced study groups per year, and 60 visitors. Uh, the activities we could uh, transform into online mode, we uh, transformed into online mode during the COVID time. Uh, these are numbers which refer to the pre-COVID time and we expect them to come back to something similar after uh, we are all will be successfully vaccinated. Uh, a bit more on advanced uh, study groups. You have seen here workshops. You are one of these workshop activities here right now. But what about advanced study groups? This is a very important uh, research vehicle for us. Uh, these advanced study groups consist of a few, four to five, maybe sometimes more um, top scientists who are grouped together to perform uh, cutting edge research at our center. Uh, they explore new research directions. They foster team research through intense collaborations. Uh, also ignite collaborations with Korean research teams outside IBS. And this can last for several months uh, in a year. And you see here a list of the different topics of the advanced study groups we had in the past. We have currently uh, one running on Coulomb correlations and coherent spin dynamics, mostly in online mode. And we hope that we can soon uh, open the activities of two more advanced study groups, which will be run uh, in uh, uh, more uh, focusing on a domestic mode, on computational approaches in correlated systems and incommensurately stacked atomic layers. Right, we do a lot of networking. Let me maybe not waste <clears throat> your time anymore uh, on that. Uh, and uh, uh, also not let me not uh, say too much about this Asian network on condensed matter, which was a very successful uh, um, a vehicle for interactions research interactions in uh, the uh, in that uh, geographical area here and which was uh, or which is supported by the ICTP in Trieste but these activities have to be resumed after the pandemic uh, period uh, will uh, disappear and with that I uh, want to wish you a nice and productive meeting and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you Sergei for this.
introduction to our center. And uh, we are still a little bit before time, thankfully. So we have a few minutes till our speakers can adjust their slides and uh, you know, set up their things. So uh, I, in the meanwhile, I'll hand over the floor to Nelly, who is our chairperson for the day. And she can take over the working from there on. Thank you, Nelly. Yes. Uh, yeah, so morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, uh, depending on which time zone you are in. And uh, it's a pleasure to, of course, to chair this opening session. Uh, it's also a pleasure, uh, thanks to Sergey, to give us like an introduction to uh, the landscape and things that are happening in IBS. I would look forward very much to visiting it one day. <laughs> so hopefully I have the, the, that opportunity. So let, let's start. And uh, of course, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sai Vinjanampati. He is from the uh, Department of Physics in IIT Bombay, India. And uh, he will be telling us about generalized measures of quantum synchronization. So um, the stage is yours, Sai. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nelly. Thank you, Juza. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this talk. And, uh, um, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. So I hope that um, um, you will be entertained and also be informed a little bit about the stuff that's happening in this little field that I'm here to report to you about. So I'm here to talk to you about quantum synchronization. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think, quite apt because uh, some of what I'll talk to you about will be, uh, a little bit of it will be about thermodynamics, but almost all of it will be about dynamics. And you can clearly see the interplay which uh, 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 which I think goes well with the theme of the workshop. Um, so let me, um, uh, on the offset, uh, basically tell you that it, all the details that I'm going to talk to you about are in this specific paper um, towards the end. So that's the title of the uh, of the talk. So um, in case you're interested in following up on details and so on and so forth, this uh, you can look for it there. Uh, let me uh, also wa warn slash uh, um, apologize to you that uh, for those of you who are experts on nonlinear dynamics, I know that several of you are. Uh, perhaps the first part of this talk will be quite uh, uh, basic. Um, uh, quantum synchronization as a field is basically at the intersection of quantum information theory, quantum thermodynamics, and nonlinear dynamics. And because then the kind of the, um, what would you say, the uh, the one topic that people are not familiar with is nonlinear dynamics. I typically tend to kind of introduce that a little bit more in detail. So. Um, uh, I apologize for that. So with that, let me just begin by uh, just uh, talking to you about what synchronization is. Um, so what is synchronization? Synchronization is the adjustment of rhythms of basically uh, oscillators and, uh, and uh, uh, with some caveats attached to it. And the caveats essentially, the devil is, is in the details. But before I say anything formal about it, let me show you a movie. So this is a, a YouTube video from uh, Harvard's Natural Sciences. So. What this is, is um, there are a bunch of metronomes that are on a, on a little platform and you can see the platform is basically just on the floor. Um, this, uh, the, the person who's demonstrating this is gonna put it on some uh, cola bottles. And what you'll see is that the metronomes which are swinging randomly uh, will start synchronizing. And so you can just visually inspect, I can hear the, the sound that the thing is making in my, in my ear now. And, uh, and you, can, you can actually see them going in unison. Right, so that adjustment of rhythms of self-sustained oscillators is basically what um, uh, synchronization is all about. Now, um, why should we care about synchronization um, in the classical world, right? Uh, first of all, in the classical world, why should we care about it? Because in the classical world, actually, uh, synchronization is ubiquitous. So it's it's all over the place. Uh, in I refer you to Stephen Strogatz's book on this, Bikovsky's book, Balanov's book. There are some very uh, fine uh, uh, textbooks on this topic. Uh, but uh, to kind of give you a brief introduction, basically all kinds of systems which have nonlinear uh, um, dynamics in them uh, tend to synchronize if you just get the get some basic conditions right. So um, where would you find examples of this in nature? So fireflies, which basically uh, blink to signal to their mates, tend to synchronize uh, their blinks to each other, uh, and this has something to do with just short-range interactions, basically. Um, uh, uh, the human eye basically receives feedback, um, uh, photic feedback from the sun. And so um, our entire physiology um, is synchronized to basically the, uh, the rhythm of, uh, of the sun. Uh, 
Um, the human heart is actually a, a collection of cells which oscillates, um, uh, which beats in tandem. And so if, you're, if, if, the, if the cells of the human heart fall out of synchrony, then uh, you have some, some form of arrhythmia, which is basically a very dangerous condition. Um, networks tend to also synchronize. And uh, so the reason that I'm pointing this out to you is that they're small objects and large objects. Um, they are, um, many of them are deeply important to us and um, they are objects that um, at least prima facie look extremely different from each other, from networks of electricity grids um, all the way out to, uh, to the human heart, right? So this is, uh, um, this is a very exciting field, I must say, um, you know, uh, classical mechanics can often be very, very exciting and this is a very exciting field. And so this is kind of the uh, one of the reasons why synchronization in the classical uh, world became very, very uh, important and, um, and interesting. So um, for this uh, workshop and for this audience, I just want to introduce to you um, what the, uh, I want to introduce to you essentially two separate things. One is uh, the fact that synchronization appears um, typically in two separate formats. One of them is called entrainment and the other is called synchronization uh, per se. And the other is I also want to introduce right off the bat and um, a measure of synchronization, a signature of synchronization. So uh, what do I mean by, uh, 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 by synchronizing quantum systems or, or classical systems? What I mean is that I have some sort of uh, uh, phase space here. So you, know, you think of it as phase space. So some sort of angle degree of freedom and you have these phase uh, oscillators which are basically traveling along the circle. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring basically the, the dynamical degree of freedom that I'm interested in is this angle that they're making, let's say with some fixed axis. So um, what you can do is you can either drive each of these, uh, just one of these uh, oscillators with an external drive, just like you would force a pendulum from the outside. Um, and, uh, and you would basically have a situation where it's a unidirectional coupling. So, so the, uh, the forcing term can basically influence the, uh, the underlying oscillator, but not the other way around. Or you can basically have several of them uh, coupled to each other and have, have them influence each other. So this is basically the, um, the situation which, uh, the two situations that I wanted to point out because they will start making a huge difference as we go downstream into the quantum bridging where I'll basically actually flesh them out in a little bit more detail. Um, in either case, uh, what, are, what are you looking for? So when you say that a classical system synchronizes, what are you looking for? So here is the classic diagram. What I'm looking for is at any drive strength epsilon. So this epsilon is either the strength with which I'm coupling these two classical systems or the strength with which I'm driving from the outside. If it's just a classical laser drive, let's say. Um, with some, at some strength epsilon, what I'm asking is, if I drive at the bare frequency, I of course, uh, uh, at the natural frequency of the oscillator, I of course know the oscillator response. Now, if I keep going off resonance, basically, if I take it off resonance and I create some detuning, um, what you can show is basically that um, is that the dynamics of the oscillator leaves the uh, natural frequency and locks onto the external drive. But it can only do this for a while. Basically, if the detuning is too large, let's say 10%, arbitrarily, I'm just throwing out a number, so 10%, then what happens is that the system is unable to respond anymore because the detuning is too large. And, uh, and what it does is simply returns back to its natural frequency. So you can draw a boundary by simply identifying what locked is and, and uh, as opposed to the opposite of that. And that boundary will reveal to you a kind of shape like this, the Arnold tongue as it's typically called. So um, I'll show you several signatures of synchronization in the quantum regime where I will basically say, this is synchronization because here is an Arnold tongue, right? And so, uh, and so I want you to kind of keep that in mind. Now, the rest of this diagram is quite self-explanatory. All that this is saying is that as you increase the drive strength, this region becomes larger and larger. So um, at zero drive, then, you know, there is basically nowhere for me to synchronize. Uh, with a little bit of drive strength, then there is a small region where I see phase locking. And then as I increase the drive strength, then this region also correspondingly increases. So that's, that's what this diagram is trying to tell us. Yeah, um, so with that little introduction, let me just tell you about the prerequisites uh, for classical synchronization, because this actually becomes, um, I would say part of the biggest conversation if you're going into this field um, uh, um, here on out, this will become the, the well, some of the biggest challenges that you have to deal with. The first of this is you have to have an underlying nonlinear dynamical system, right? So why do you have to have an underlying nonlinear dynamical system? Uh, because otherwise uh, there is really, um, Anything is synchronization. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, which is uh, which is to simply say that if I take a um, I take a harmonic oscillator and I give it some energy, then it defines a fixed uh, elliptical orbit, and then if I give it a slightly different energy, then that's a valid orbit as well. And these things are not synchronizing systems. It's just linear physics. There's not anything interesting 
um, uh, interesting here. So what you want is an underlying nonlinear dynamical system so that you form what's called a limit cycle. Um, and so this is the first thing that you need. Um, the second is that this limit cycle oscillator needs to be self-sustaining. So the simplest way to explain this is basically, uh, this is a diagram um, that I've paraphrased, I think from Balanoff, I, I don't remember anymore. Um, uh, and, and the idea is the following. So let me just tell you what the idea is. So I'm plotting some arbitrary parameter on the, on the x-axis. So let's say it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's the radial coordinate. Um, and now what I'm asking is, I'm asking what kind of situation can I have where I form a limit cycle, a stable limit cycle. And the situation is the following. So suppose I'm, I'm here in this region, right? So value of R is in this region. Then there is a, the, there is a linear pumping basically, which pumps me up. And the linear pumping amplitude is larger than the nonlinear damping amplitude. And so what happens is the pump takes over and pushes me towards this spot here. Whereas on the other side, the damp is larger than the pump and it pushes me down. So what happens is that on either side of this, uh, you just get pushed back into this, uh, this stable fixed point basically. And so that's an energy balance point here. Uh, and at that energy balance point, you basically have an oscillator which can sustain itself. So that's the self-sustained oscillator. So you need that self-sustained oscillator so that you actually are talking about synchronization in exactly the same way that our friends and colleagues in the uh, in classical mechanics understand that phrase, right? And I say this essentially to kind of uh, point at the fact that there is a lot of controversy on what synchronization is even in the quantum uh, community. Now, uh, the third uh, condition I would say is uh, required is that uh, along with the limit cycle, um, you, you know, you have to show me that there is a free phase that you can lock onto. This is a point that seldom arises in the classical context, but it will show up in the quantum context. So um, uh, excuse the fact that this essentially looks slightly weird here. Um, so here, what do I mean? The moment I basically show you that there is a limit cycle, there is an oscillator there. There's nothing, there's nothing more to discuss in classical mechanics, uh, a la Kuromoto or, or, or any other model. There is already a, a, an oscillator here, which, you know, which is going around the, around the ring. Uh, the problem is that in the quantum case, the situation is slightly subtle. And let me just highlight that subtlety view when we get to it. So um, I want to just end the slide by basically pointing out that uh, these are the three prerequisites for classical synchronization um, that we need. And, um, and I say this basically to just set the tone for quantum synchronization when, when we go into it. Now, uh, with that, let me ask the following question, uh, which perhaps many of you are asking, which is why bother with quantum mechanics, right? What's the, what's the great reason? What is the great desire? What are we as quantum information theorists uh, uh, and people who are interested in quantum technology at various aspects, uh, what are we interested in, in this stuff for, right? And um, the answer to this basically uh, came during the time that I was transitioning from my PhD um, to my first postdoc, so around 2010, where uh, nanomechanical resonators were being cooled to their ground state and demonstrated to be cooled to their ground state. So this is from Keith Schwab's lab. Um, and you can see that, um, that once we master the capacity to have nanomechanical resonators in the ground state, um, you really have the capacity to uh, have this interplay between quantum dynamics and classical dynamics. And so this interplay between quantum dynamics and classical dynamics uh, makes for a very, um, a very exciting study of synchronization in the, in the quantum regime. And this is one of the kind of uh, central reasons. So um, with that, let me show you a diagram that I've been, uh, I have been showing for five years now. This was a diagram that I drew with some of my collaborators on a, on a notebook, uh, in CQT actually. Um, and so, uh, so what I imagine is the following, which is, you know, here is a kind of standard uh, uh, cantilever. So it's an experiment that many of us do in high school. Um, and uh, you, you can also force it from the outside. Now, if you basically apply a, a, a magnetic field and you start loading the end of the cantilever with magnetic, uh, magnetically sensitive quantum systems, then you are automatically have an interplay between mechanical degrees of freedom and quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And you could keep the mechanical entirely classical and you could keep the quantum mechanical, uh, quantum mechanical degrees of freedom entirely quantum. And so you have this kind of very interesting mix of dynamics that, that, that comes up. And it provides us, I think, a tremendous opportunity to kind of bring the stuff that we know about classical synchronization into the quantum regime. So that's something that I just wanted to uh, show you here. Uh, and finally, uh, we're not uh, the first and, uh, and, and definitely uh, uh, this is not an original thought. So here is an example from the literature. Uh, so this is Kerry Vahala's uh, work uh, from 2009 on basically uh, using the Van der Poel oscillator as a um, uh, uh, as a phonon laser. Yeah. Uh, so should I take questions now, uh, 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 Nelly, or should I just wait for the end? I, you can. You are free to take questions if you if you okay. want to. Okay. I, I, I see. I see a raised hand, so I'm happy to take questions. 
Great, thanks. So you mentioned uh, there is entirely classical, entirely quantum. Can you tell us what's your what's the difference in your mind? What's the quantumness about it? Oh uh, yeah, so you can quantify it in 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 many different ways. So typically, uh, the kind of uncontroversial way that people would talk about it is action over h bar. So the um, uh, so uh, you would say, are you close to the ground state or are you very far away from the ground state? So this is the practical way in which people have talked about it in the literature. Um, so if the, uh, if the um, uh, average number expectation value of let's say a harmonic mode, which I'll show you um, is, is, uh, has hundreds of photons in it or dozens of photons in it, then perhaps we're not in the classical regime, uh, in the quantum regime anymore, or at least we have to have a discussion about it. Right? This is one way to do it. Another way to do it is basically uh, to check whether the mean field dynamics actually is in agreement with um, the uh, full classical dynamics or um, uh, sorry, the quantum dynamics. Uh, it is sufficient to describe uh, by simply looking at the classical dynamics, the mean field dynamics, or if you need more moments. So there are many ways to kind of, you know, and, and as, as I show you some diagrams, this will also become very clear. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? So, uh, what do you mean by classical forcing of a quantum system? Because force is not a well-defined concept in quantum mechanics, right? Oh, I, I just mean exactly this experiment. I, I, I just this is motivation. So, I take it for what it's worth. Uh, all, all I mean is just this kind of a thing, which is I have a let's say I have an anisotropic magnetic field. So, depending on where I am, the quant the qubit degree of freedom or the qubit degree of freedom that's at the end of the cantilever is seeing a different force. And now I just couple it to basically just a classical resonator. So this thing has hundreds of phonons in it, whatever, but kind of the separation is such that, um, and the gradient of the magnetic field is such that I need to worry only about the extreme ends, right? And it's just, you can design these kinds of, uh... so this this guy is completely classical, whereas this, these qubits may be, you know, maybe embedded, but be at a frequency where, you know, you don't care about the temperature that you're operating at. I see, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, yeah, okay. Very good. Um, so with that, let me uh, let me move on to the first kind of quantum uh, part of this conversation, which is uh, quantum synchronization um, um, a la anharmonic oscillators, right? Um, so this, uh, so what I want to do is I want to transition all of us from classical synchronization over to quantum, and uh, and just um, share with you how how we would do this in the in the quantum context. So this is a classic example. So one of the kind of prototypical examples of synchronization in the classical regime is to just study the Van der Poel oscillator. So uh, let me just explain to uh, uh, to all of us what uh, the Van der Poel oscillator is. So it's just a harmonic oscillator, so x double dot plus omega square x, and then there is just a linear pumping term, a minus gamma one x dot, and then a nonlinear damping term. And I've explained to you why you need this linear pumping and nonlinear damping. It's because you need that energy balance so that you get a stable fixed point, right? And now you can also force it from here, right? So just to kind of give you a, 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 a pH 101 kind of picture, um, here is a, a diagram of what uh, the, the dynamics looks like if I just set gamma 1 equals gamma 2 equals some constant which I've just called mu in these, uh, uh, in these plots that I've made. And uh, what you can see is that when mu is small, which means that you know the, the inherent nonlinearity that you're applying is quite small, this thing looks quasi-harmonic. It basically looks like a harmonic oscillator, but it's doing something funny. And what it's doing is that wherever you set it up, it just rolls into this limit cycle. You can see there are tens of limits. Uh, uh, there are tens of oscillations here. You know, you can count them here exactly. There may be four or five oscillations here, where you know where it takes time to roll into the limit cycle, right? And um, and as you increase the nonlinearity, the the limit cycle becomes more and more deformed, which is you know interesting for a different set of. Uh, context, which I won't get into here. Yeah. So this is what the, the phase space dynamics looks like. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and along with that, I just wanted to share with you what I mean by phase localization, right? So in this context, what do I mean by phase localization? So you can see that there are, uh, there are these, uh, these things that are moving around in a circle. So the quasi harmonic example, you can just take mu equals 0.1. And I can set several of them up and I can set them up in such a way that if I track the particles, they could essentially be on a circle. And now I could couple them and ask whether they get closer to each other and, and hence their, their rhythms adjust and they start synchronizing uh, 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 their oscillations to each other or are, are they doing something different, right? So I could, I could ask these kinds of questions. Um, and so, uh, and so that's, what, that's what I mean. So I mean that that phase degree of freedom that you've just seen, um, I want to kind of try and lock it either to an external drive or lock several of them to each other, yeah? Okay. So um, from master equations uh, to quantum synchronization. So how do I go basically from quantum mechanics to, uh, to this kind of a picture? 
So this was done uh, by uh, Walter Noon and Kempen Bruder in uh, Piadal in 2014, uh, and Lee and Sadehpur uh, shortly thereafter. Um, so the, the way to do this the following. Uh, Walter Bruder and Kemp did was they pointed out that if you start with a master equation of the following type, uh, where basically um, you have a, a Lindbladian superoperator which represents linear pumping. So this is exactly the analog of the classical version that you saw and a nonlinear damp as well, the analog of the nonlinear damping that you, that you saw before. And the Hamiltonian is basically um, some detuning times a number operator and F times Y uh, operator. So Y is basically A minus A dagger. Uh, then basically, if you just calculate um, what the equation of motion for the expectation value of the annihilation operator is, so this is uh, this complex number beta, which is just defined as trace of A rho, then the beta dot equation essentially is some cousin of the Van der Poel oscillator. So it's what's called the Stuart Landau oscillator. And so, uh, and so what they pointed out, uh, uh, what Walter Bruder and Nunekem pointed out is basically that um, you could arrive at the uh, classical equation uh, for a Stuart Landau oscillator by starting from a quantum mechanical system where the dissipators had a nonlinearity inside it, right? And so that's that's interesting. Um, and uh, and then they basically plotted diagrams like this. So I just want to explain this diagram to you because this also answers one of the questions that was asked about what's classical, what's quantum, how do I think about it? So here are two regimes, uh, one basically where the uh, action over h bar is very large and the other where the action over h bar is very small. Uh, when the action over h bar is very large, what's plotted here is the Wigner function. So this is uh, uh, is the uh, normalized uh, momentum expectation value and position expectation value, um, and uh, uh, for the classical uh, oscillator. And on top of it, basically, is superposed the normalized Wigner function. So both of them are sitting right on top of each other. And so the black line is the classical dynamics that you would expect if you just picked some parameters, gamma one, gamma two, delta, and uh, f, the amplitude and phase of f, and you just plotted this, you would expect some circle like this. And this is just the limit cycle oscillator. And now uh, what they showed was that the Wigner function sits right on top of it, you know, perhaps as we should expect. Um, now, on the other hand, when you basically uh, take, the, uh, take the small action over h bar limit, when you go into the deep quantum regime, then what happens is that the classical limit cycle dynamics is sitting over here, whereas the quantum is a little bit more smeared out basically because of the uncertainty principle. And so uh, this kind of diagram the, they showed and uh, to kind of um, convince the reader that there is synchronization uh, um, just as we understand it in the quantum uh, in the quantum case. So there is phase localization in this case. So the way to think about this is that instead of thinking about this in position and momentum space, you could also think of it um, in, uh, in terms of number and phase operators. And if you think of it as the phase operator, uh, the phase operator is completely delocalized over here. Whereas the phase operator has a localized value over here, which tracks basically the conversation from the classical dynamics. So this is basically the point that they were trying to make. Okay, so I already want to highlight. Right. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, sir. can I just ask a question? I'm, I'm a bit puzzled. So yes. the the black uh, the black uh, the loop is the classical solution, right? It's a yes. limit cycle. Yes. Uh, how can it be that the so normally on a limit side on if you have an oscillator, then a momentum should always change sign, but this doesn't uh, seem to be the case in Figure B. So the black loop is always uh, sitting at negative p's. So I, uh, I, I, can, I can look at the exact paper to tell you ex exactly what's happening. So I believe what they did here was basically they were just trying to establish that there is a limit cycle. And in the large action over H bar, you actually do expect to see what you see in the classical regime, uh, in the quantum, the quantum and the classical agree with each other. Whereas uh, here, I think they were trying to turn down the, the quantum dynamics, but also they were doing something to, the, uh, uh, to this F. So, uh, so the classical version of this F. So, um, but I don't remember the details anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, so, sorry, Sai. Uh, quick uh, question again about yeah. this panel B that you show here. So, uh, for a synch for synchronization, you need a limit cycle, right? But in this, yes. what you call as a deep quantum regime, yes, I don't really see a limit cycle type of behavior. It's more like a localization behavior. Isn't no, it? I think this is already so, driven. This is already the driven dynamics that you're looking at. I see. Because okay. you look at the quantum and you can see there's phase localization already. So they are not trying to tell show you the limit cycle underneath. They're just directly just showing you the local, uh, localization, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, maybe you will talk about it later, but uh, you mentioned a couple of times 
like the phase operator and measuring phases. So, so phase is not an observable in quantum physics, right? It's it's a parameter. You can you can make it a you can make something like an observable, which is some kind of unbounded operator, but it's really not yeah. an observable. Yeah. So I so I wonder, you know, because you talk about a synchronization, but no, no, you yeah. So this is systems. Yes. So they mentioned two things, two separate things in the paper. One is that. Um, uh, is that you can define basically, uh, you can take the Wigner function and you can integrate out the radial coordinate and you can define uh, a normalized probability distribution which only belongs in the phase degree of freedom. And that's what mm -hmm. plot, they, they show you the plots of that to convince you that there is phase localization. So in that technical sense, they're basically talking about phase. Oh, I see. But uh, um, no notion of uh, let's say Peg and Barnett phase operators or anything is used to no unbounded phase operators are actually used to measure synchronization in the quantum regime. So in the quantum regime, as I will show you in a second, uh, what they use is um, uh, several measures, all of which are well-defined. They are either depending on power spectrum or they depend on basically this kind of Wigner function based measures and so on and so forth, which are perfectly well-defined. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, more questions? Okay, so uh, let me just summarize uh, again, because this is an important point, which is um, um, I've already snuck in through this conversation, uh, the point that uh, Walter Bruden and Kemp make in their uh, paper, which is that uh, they're measuring quantum synchronization using a phase space based measure. So they're looking in phase space and they're saying something about what phase space looks like to basically make that argument about, uh, about synchronization. So this is something that I just want to, uh, I just want, to uh, want to highlight because this also becomes important. Uh, um, okay, so with that, let me just uh, quickly introduce what phase space based measures of synchronization, how you would construct them. So um, phase space based measures, um, you know, so there are many phase space measures in quantum optics. Uh, so here is the Husimi Q representation function. Uh, and the Husimi Q representation function, you can think of as being derived from the Wigner function, or you can think of the Wigner as being derived from the Husimi. And I wanted to highlight both of these at the same place because the Husimi to me is much easier to define. It's just the expectation value of the coherent state. Um, and the Wigner on the other hand is the one that was uh, that was used by Walter Bruder and Nunenkamp. So you can, you can make an association between these two uh, by simply just uh, this integral transform. And uh, what I just also want to highlight is something that all of us know, which is basically that um, both uh, the any pro, any phase space uh, quasi probability distribution, uh, the Husimi Q representation, the Wigner function, um, uh, all of them are basically one to one with the density matrix. So it is as if I'm just giving you the density matrix directly when I give you the phase space uh, uh, phase space measure. And so uh, uh, um, a measure of synchronization which is based on uh, a phase space uh, um, uh, quasi probability distribution is as if you're just calculating it directly out of the density matrix. So this is just something I just want to uh, make uh, very clear. And you know, and here is just a picture of one of these uh, uh, Q representation functions for squeeze states. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, uh, let me also point a little bit at the other measures that were used. So one measure that was implicitly al already there, and it's made more explicit in the paper, um, is uh, uh, this uh, mm. phase space based measure of synchronization. Um, yes, Nelly, uh, did you have a question? Yes, can I can I quickly interject because there's a question in the chat ah, asked yes. uh, for I can't see the chat. slides above. So when we were talking about the master equation and the, the, the dissipator, sure. um, the question is asked by Ricardo and Ancheta, um, basically uh, trying uh, asking about uh, whether the nonlinearity is only in the dissipator but not in the Hamiltonian. Uh, there are many examples where they have been put all over the place. So, uh, so there are there are dissipative. Uh, so you have to have dissipative nonlinearity. This is a must, because otherwise, what you don't uh, you don't have the analog of the uh, of the stable limit cycle. But um, if you um, if you have basically uh, dissipative nonlinearity, people have also kind of put all kinds of nonlinearities in the in the Hamiltonian structure, and, uh, and there are some papers on this as well, which I can point out. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the analog exam uh, the examples of few level atoms that I'll show, uh, everything is nonlinear. Like every single term in the in the thing is nonlinear. Yeah. So I that's see. okay. So I didn't need these slides after all. Uh, okay. I also see a raised hand by Taufik Murtado. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so I have a question about you said it's one to one between the Hishimi function and the density matrix. Yes. But uh, as far as I learned, uh, because in phase space representation, it's actually like continuous. 
But, you know, in, in quantum mechanics, the degree of freedoms is kind of discrete. So I wonder how can it be one to one? Oh, no, no. So there are two, um, uh, there are two distinctions in kind of, uh, quant there is essentially two classes of quantum mechanical problems that we study. So when we begin basically uh, perhaps our bachelor's or master's quantum mechanics, um, we're usually use, introduced to kind of square well potentials, infinite square wells, so on and so forth, hydrogen atom. All of these are continuous variable degrees of freedom. There's an infinite, uh, a set of uh, a set of modes there, and uh, so the simpler way to handle them is through function space, through differential equations and function space. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there is a separate set which is basically uh, there's a separate way of doing linear algebra just for finite dimensional matrices, which is a much simpler object that we deal with uh, um, on the side. So, um, so as you so this question is actually very very important, uh, Taufik. So I, I thank you for bringing it up. Um, so the point really here is that uh, even though what I'm saying here is for in for the same Hilbert space dimensionality. So if I have a harmonic oscillator, uh, whether I give you the density matrix for it or I give you the Q function or the W, it's the same. Uh, this statement is true everywhere as well. So when I go to spins, the, the real question that you should ask is how do you define coherent states for spins? And once I show you how to define coherent states for spins, uh, the Q function will also basically have only a few parameters. And so you will be able to capture everything about uh, um, a finite dimensional Hilbert space basically, yeah. Uh, but yeah, wouldn't it be like over complete kind of thing? They're all over complete, yeah, but that's yeah. by design. So that you, okay. the diagonal distribution already tells you everything that you need to know. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Good, okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, with that, let me just introduce to you just a couple of more uh, measures of quantum synchronization, because this is of course, um, the, the whole talk is about the measures uh, per se. Uh, so here is another measure of quantum synchronization, again, from uh, Walter Bruder Nunenkamp's paper. And so what they're looking at is basically the power spectrum that, uh, that comes out of the system. So this is uh, the Fourier transform of this quantity. And, um, and the only thing I just want you to take away from here is the following, which is that um, uh, here is where the classical drive frequency is. is. It's implied by basically the, these delta function peaks. And then the quantum dynamics, basically the, the Fourier transform is plotted on right on top of it. And you can see the peak is kind of proximate to uh, where the classical, uh, the classical blue peak is, right? And then there are these other uh, uh, values of the parameters for which basically, uh, so the detuning is basically 0.5 versus 0.7, um, where basically there is somewhat of a large uh, deviation and they make commentary on this and so on. This is not very important for our for our purposes, but the central point I just want you to take away from this slide is basically the power spectrum can also be used. So you could basically just take a very, uh, a, a very operational approach. You could just say, uh, I know synchronization is oscillation and, and my oscillating atoms will emit. So I just look at the power spectrum. I just stand back at a distance. I stare at what, uh, what the emission that is coming out and the peak of the emission I identify as basically being the observed frequency. And, uh, and by using this as well, they were able to show that you can plot essentially an Arnold tongue. And so uh, this measure also follows the Arnold tongue uh, description. Okay. Um, okay. And so, and with that, let me just show you the first Arnold tongue in the, in the, in the, in the whole story. So this was a paper by uh, Ameri and Sarofatsios on this paper. Um, and so what they were saying is the following. They said, look, what are we really trying to study? Let's think about it again from our perspective. Um, we, uh, and this was around the time when people were thinking about entanglement or discord or complicated measures of synchronization, basically. And, uh, you, you know, somewhat motivated from the, uh, from the entanglement um, school of study. And so what um, uh, Ameri and others basically were saying was they said, look, uh, it makes no sense for us to study a phenomenon like synchronization, which exists in the classical world by constructing a measure that will completely fall apart in the classical world. So let's say if you create an entanglement measure, entanglement measure will register zero whenever you hit the classical world. So the moment I hit a classical boundary, if I register zero, then I'm actually doing a disservice to the field that I'm trying to study. And uh, so here is the ex cartoon here, which is you know a two metronomes. I just showed you the video of several metronomes. I can study them. I, I can study the synchronization, the classical synchronization of two metronomes. And if I just happen to keep cooling them, then I get into this weird regime that we're interested in, right? So their proposal was basically, they said, um, uh, oh, so here is the system that they were considering. So there were two cavities with qubits in each cavity coupled to each other. So it's a, it's a slightly, um, um, it's a slightly complicated um, uh, system. But what they were basically saying was they were saying, um, let's study the mutual information between the two, 
the two systems, right? And uh, so this is the this is really the only point that I want you to take away, which is mutual information actually is a well defined information theoretic quantity that is well defined both for uh, Shannon entropy type quantities and von Neumann entropy type quantities. So it can it can go through kind of the classical quantum transition along with your quantum system. So if you take basically one of these, you know, this kind of a, a cartoon example of these two metronomes, and you just pour liquid nitrogen or cool the whole thing down, as you are performing the transition. Your mutual information measure could actually follow you, basically, just just quite quite nicely into the quantum regime, and follow you back up into the classical regime. So their proposal was let's study mutual information as a measure, right? And so this is something also that I want you to just uh, take away with uh, with you, okay? So in all of these, um, I just want to highlight to you. So uh, what I've shown you thus far uh, till now is basically several examples of uh, of. Uh, measures of, uh, of synchronization. And so um, now I'm going to go into the, um, into the few atom regime and also just expand this whole conversation before I show you our solution. Um, before I kind of get carried away, I just wanted to again highlight to you what angles am I talking about? I'm talking about this particular angle, right? Um, I'm talking about the fact that if I just have a, uh, have a harmonic oscillator mode, nothing attached to it, nothing. So the number operator basically um, is the operator. So the states are number states and they're phase invariant. And now if I basically drive them, then they start driving along this direction. And so the phase locking is, I'm, I'm interested in that direction, right? So think of it very visually, right? Uh, which is I have a pendulum and it, it basically, if I do nothing, it's just moving in this direction. That's the degree of freedom I want to lock to. So that's the physical degree of freedom that I want to lock to. And so this conversation also becomes very important as we go along. So this is why this cartoon is here. Uh, Bhavish, I am happy to take a question. Uh, hi. Uh, so hi. I just wanted to ask in the previous slide that you showed that you they study quantum information for the metronome experiment. Uh -huh. uh, so so what would be the states of the metronome here and like so the metronome is a cartoon, uh, Bhavish. Sorry, I'm okay. I, I'm I'm sorry for the confusing imagery. The actual quantum system is actually. Um, uh, I don't know if it is in, invalid is the phrase to use, but oh. it's it's controversial. Oh. So I just want to leave it out of the discussion. Oh, it's, so uh, the system is, is something different. But the system is two cavities, right? So you can see the oh, right, right, AI right. going from one to two. And ah, each okay, cavity okay. has like some qubits inside it. And you want to study whether the qubits are synchronizing to each other. Uh, because the cavities can talk to each other. They're leaky cavities right. that can talk to each other, basically. Right. right. OK, OK. Oh, that makes so more the, sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, but if you were to study metronomes, uh, uh, Bhavish, uh, literally you would just use one of these anharmonic Van der Poel oscillator uh, master equations that we were defined that were defined before. Yeah. So you could actually I could answer the question that you were directly asking. It just happens oh. to be not not the one on the slide. Okay. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So okay. So um, again, just to emphasize uh, to to just underline this square this this slide. Uh, so which angle? Uh, so what you have to do is you have to look at what the free dynamics is, and the free dynamics just simply puts you in this direction. So you switch off f, and you ask what's happening. Uh, it just it it creates these kind of uh, these kinds of concentric rings, which I can um, um, think of as phase invariant states. And then what you want to do is you want to ask what happens if I put if I switch on a drive. The drive actually uh, it's a it's an operator that takes me along this direction, right? Because uh, because of the dA dagger and dA square, I'm stuck along this limit cycle. And so what the drive does is it actually can manipulate this free free phase degree of freedom, and so that's the uh, that's the direction in which we would want to lock. Okay, so with that, let me just give you the only uh, one of the only two side notes in this entire conversation. So um, we took this problem. So the power spectrum that I showed you, there are some issues with the power spectrum um, uh, with respect to basically its observability in the deep quantum regime. So um, we worked on a solution on how basically uh, a squeezing operator applied to this basically can help you uh, with the whole story. I won't say anything more than this. And this is in a, in a paper from a couple of years ago, which I just uh, highlight. Okay, so with that, let me move on to the next uh, stage of the of the talk, which is about n-level atoms. And uh, what I'm going to show you towards the end is how to combine all of these into one uh, into one uh, information theoretic measure. This is where I'm going. Okay, so um, again, the question is, how do I discuss uh, synchronizing n-level atoms? So let's say two-level atoms, three-level atoms, four-level atoms. I want to now have this conversation not for harmonic modes or har and harmonic modes, but I want to have this for uh, for kind of finite level systems. So this was the question again that uh, uh, Bruder was asking. And so let's again recap, uh, synchronization of classical systems requires an existence of a limit cycle and uh, these angular coordinates should then exhibit locking if you if you phase lock them, right? Um, so 
so this is a, a classic example. Uh, if you want to look at it in the radial direction, this is just a stable limit cycle. I've just written it out, the differential equations for it, if you want to look at it. So um, what uh, Bruder asked, uh, uh, Roulet and Bruder asked, Alex Roulet, uh, who was at CPT, what uh, Roulet and Bruder asked was they said, uh, well, does this preclude qubits, right? And so does the existence of a limit cycle preclude qubits? And of course, they're asking this question, so the answer is yes. Um, and uh, the argument is the following. I just want to present the argument to you. The argument is basically, they said, well, take a, uh, take a, uh, take a limit cycle for a, uh, for a, uh, uh, for a single qubit density matrix, right? What is a limit cycle? A limit cycle is one where at least one phase degree of freedom is left open, right? So qubits are, uh, are, uh, are expressed on the block sphere. So they're states on the block sphere. So they have a radial degree of freedom, which is irrelevant to the discussion. And then there are two angles, theta and phi. So, um, so let's try and fix basically um, uh, the, uh, the, the population so that we fix basically the, the amount of admixture between zero and one. So when I fix the population, so let's say P and P bar I fix, uh, what do I do? I'm basically fixing the theta degree of freedom. I'm fixing cos square theta over two, sine square theta over two, right? And then uh, I'm, I have a phi degree of freedom that I, the, that I can then think about uh, locking onto, right? Exactly the same as, uh, as, uh, as all the other limit cycles. So what uh, they showed was basically, so this is the argument that I've just presented. What they basically pointed out, essentially, the, the argument is trivial entirely, is that uh, if you multiply one by e to the minus i phi times one, it's, uh, it just goes away, it's a gauge degree of freedom. So it's an unobservable um, uh, phase, basically. So even though you have a limit cycle, mathematically, you don't actually have, you can't see it. You, it's not an observable limit cycle. And so they, um, they basically precluded qubit synchronization. And this is something that I just want to highlight because um, depending on how much we bring from classical mechanics into this quantum world um, uh, that we are in right now, the definition of synchronizations change. So you could disagree with me um, uh, in the Q and A and you can say, here is a paper that I have read and which says that qubits can be synchronized. And I'm happy to make this discussion with you. All of those examples are the ones where they're ignoring one of these these statements. And so I think the community as a whole, as we go forward, we'll have to decide whether which of these comments are basically the important ones and which are the unimportant ones. Um, uh, and so I just want to maintain to you that, uh, that uh, so long as I'm concerned and so long as I think Bruder's paper is concerned, qubits cannot be synchronized. Okay. Um, so, the ne so the smallest quantum system that you can indeed consider is a spin one atom. Right, so it's a three-level system. So, uh, uh, so what uh, uh, Roulet and Bruder did was the following: is they said, okay, so why don't we take basically a, a three-level atom, but a symmetric three-level atom, so an equally spaced three-level atom. So the two uh, energy level spacings are the same; they're omega naught. Um, and then what I do is I basically I pump uh, um, from below and I damp from above. Uh, and so when I just leave the system alone, it just settles in the in the middle state, right? So the middle state is observable, and uh, I'll show you that it also corresponds to a free degree of freedom, a free phase, right? So this is basically the, the whole point. Now, how do I do this? Um, uh, the way I have to do it is I have to follow uh, uh, classical mechanics. Yeah, Matthew, you had a question? Hi, I was just wondering about the, the two slides ago, about the 2018 PRL. So you were showing that the because the phase doesn't manifest in the populations, and you uh -huh. don't Get the limit cycle, but what if you had coherences, or maybe if you coupled your qubits to an open a bath, so then you can actually vary the the r of the block sphere. So the moment you basically have coherences, you already are phase localized in the degree of freedom that you're trying to lock. So you know, remember what you have to have when you have uh, classical classical mechanical oscillators that you're trying to synchronize. You have to have many oscillators. And if you leave them alone, if you don't touch them, they should just be running around, right? Like runners on a circle. And when you couple them, basically, then they basically adjust their rhythms to come together, to go apart, to do whatever, to do, to do the various complexities that we know in classical mechanics. The problem here is that the only way for you to observe, basically, that there are runners available is to actually lock them, which uh, uh, Bruder uh, uh, argues precludes it from actually being a valid limit cycle. Because it's not an observable limit cycle. That's the, that's the whole argument. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I have 15-ish uh, minutes more, so let me speed up a little bit. Um, so, uh, so now uh, what I want to do is basically I want to point out to you how to synchronize spins, right? 
So how do you discuss uh, phase localization in spins? Uh, where, what is the free phase? This is again, again, the question that you have to ask. So what did we do for harmonic modes? What we did was we took the, uh, uh, we took the displacement operator and uh, applied it on the quantum vacuum and we defined a coherent state. And, um, and then we uh, took the expectation value with respect to the steady state of the master equation. And that's how we defined the uh, Husimi Q representation function, right, normalized. So you do the exact same thing for spins as well. So spins also have a spin coherent state that you can define, but because spins uh, are basically bounded both from below and above, you can define the coherent state either pegged to the bottom or pegged to the top. Um, and so one of the canonical representations I've just written out uh, mathematically for you here uh, is this representation. And so you take this N, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, coherent state, and you can define basically um, um, a Q function, a Husini Q representation function for N level atoms basically. So this is uh, as simple as it goes. And now when you plot this uh, object for the, uh, for the N level atoms, you can show that there is actually a free phase. So let me show that to you. So for Roulette Bruder, what they basically showed was that um, the, uh, the relevant object is basically called N2. So it's the SU2 subgroup of SU3, if you're interested in a slightly technical detail. It has two angles, this theta and phi. And what they basically pointed out was, base, was, that, um, was that in this coherent state, if you apply the free uh, 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 Hamiltonian, then the phi degree of freedom basically moves, but the theta degree of freedom doesn't move. So uh, it's as if you have a pendulum and the pendulum is rocking along this direction, but the length is not changing. So the length is an irrelevant degree of freedom and you can just integrate it out. So um, what you can then do is you can basically plot the Husimi Q representation function. And you can in fact show that corresponding to this one zero state, uh, there is actually an entire band which has an angle which is completely free. So in the equatorial plane, you could be anywhere, it's observable, but you, it's not locked basically. So that's the whole, that's the whole point of view that, uh, that, that they took on this. And uh, then what they basically showed was that using this, you can construct a Q, uh, you can construct a synchronization measure. And the way you construct a synchronization measure is you take out the degree of freedom that you're not interested in. So let me again remind you, there are two uh, angles here, theta and phi. Theta essentially represents the, the probabilities uh, of, the, of the three level atoms. So how much probability is there in the, uh, in the minus one, how much is in the zero and how much is in the plus one. So by integrating that out, you actually get the phase dynamics of the, of the atom. And uh, the, 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 um, the corresponding synchronization measure S of phi is constructed by, by making these arguments. So this is the, this is the underlying um, construction. Okay, again, all I want to highlight to you is basically that this construction is a little bit tedious. It involves uh, recognizing the, uh, the, the corresponding SU and coherent states and then you know, constructing the Q function, integrating out. Uh, this, is a, this is a slightly messy procedure. So um, let me just quickly flash that we did the same thing uh, for an engine application. So to study uh, um, uh, kind of Scoville, Schultz, Dubois, uh, thermal engines, basically, uh, we studied the same thing, but in the full SU3. And so the full SU3 has a few more angles. So you can recognize the Q function. Again, an expectation value of the steady state in the, uh, in the uh, in the corresponding coherent state, the coherent state just has more description attached to it. And then you have to take out some unit part, which basically represents uh, the identity and you get a synchronization measure. The only thing I want you to take away from this is more angles, more integration. This is the only thing that I just want you to walk away with. Okay. So um, just as a side note, uh, we showed that there is an Arnold tongue that you can see. And uh, the other thing that we also showed was that this Arnold tongue can be understood in terms of an L1 norm of coherence measure. This is important because I'm going to flash again the L1 norm of coherence uh, in about uh, five minutes time, okay? And there's some engine related statements here, which I thought I could make if there was time, but let me just move past it. Okay, so let me just, with this, let me highlight to you the issues with existing measures. The first issue is basically that the power spectrum based methods are very tedious. You actually have to calculate the power spectrum uh, over the entire frequency domain, so on and so forth. And this is actually a computationally even tedious task. The second is that the phase space based measures have too many angles, right? So the number of angles goes as uh, two times N minus one. And so the total number of angles basically proliferates. And so this integration procedure, so if you were to study a 10 level atom, you'd just, you'd just be there all day basically doing this calculation. Uh, the third is that the mutual information ignores any details about the marginals as I'll show you in a second. Uh, so the mutual information is in fact, probably the closest to a very good definition that we, uh, that we like. 
Um, and uh, the fourth problem that, that we have is that we cannot really synchronize dissimilar systems with these techniques that are there before. And what we're really interested in is James Cummings type problems, basically atoms inside cavities that are coupled to each other and would drive the whole thing. And we want to study synchronization, not uh, kind of not just James Cummings dynamics here. Uh, the fifth is basically that entrainment and synchronization have to be treated essentially on completely separate platforms. So entrainment has to be studied as external driving, blah, blah, blah. Synchronization has to be studied essentially on, you know, in a different uh, method altogether. And so they're not treated on an equal footing, which we also fix with our measure. And the very last thing is, uh, is something that I will begin my next uh, part of the talk with, which is deformation of limit cycles is completely ignored in the perturbative study of, of synchronization. So till now, all of the synchronization studies that I've shown you are basically in the perturbative regime. And so in the perturbative regime, you're not supposed to deform the limit cycle. And because of this, people have actually ignored the fact that they are, the limit cycles are very easily deformed, especially in the quantum context with a little bit of power. Okay, so with that, um, let me just quickly uh, uh, come to the end of my talk, the last 10 minutes or so, uh, with this unified measure, which is the substance of my uh, of the current paper that I want to highlight to you. Um, and so let me highlight to you what the story is by just showing you this cartoon. So I, suppose I have an undriven Van der Poel oscillator. So you, know, you can see my cursor. So the classical limit cycle is there and the Wigner function is surrounding it. Now what I do is I just kick it. I, I drive it by applying some force on it. What it does, is un, unknown to me, it heats the quantum system. It does something to the quantum system which deforms the underlying limit cycle, right? So the limit cycle actually goes over there. And now what happens is that my quantum system is phase localized. I see that it's phase localized, but when I try and account for it, I'm getting the wrong numbers. And why do I get the wrong accountancy from it? Because this deformation has not been taken into account. No measures of synchronization that exist till now take into account the fact that you can deform the limit cycle and then phase lock around it. And so we wanted to fix that. Um, and so what we did was we proposed a unified measure of synchronization. Uh, you know, so this was in my cartoon uh, in the title slide, uh, which is basically, uh, it's just a KL divergence uh, relative entropy discussion. So we proposed two measures of synchronization. One is the relative entropy of synchronization, which is minimizing the relative entropy of the given state to a set of limit cycle states. So really what we're doing is we're borrowing the language from quantum information theory. And we're saying, look, there is not one limit cycle there. For a given dynamics, for a given damping rate, there is one dynamics, uh, but uh, one limit cycle. But from an information theoretic point of view, there is actually many, many limit cycles there. And because you could change the limit cycle by actually doing something to the quantum system uh, as well, you want to take that into account by, uh, by using this modified definition, which accounts for a set of limit cycles. Uh, and if you minimize the relative entropy, you just get the relative entropy of synchronization. Whereas if you minimize the trace distance, you get the trace distance measure of synchronization, right? So this is a very simple mathematical statement that I can write. Um, and so I just highlighted to you in pictures again. So what I'm basically saying in pictures is, I don't take this dotted line, which is the original limit cycle underneath. I take perhaps this outer uh, line that I have drawn, which is basically the true limit cycle. If I turned off the coherent interaction, which would delocalize the quantum system, but left the new damping alone uh, in there. And so, uh, and so my coherent uh, drive is coming with some damping. And so, I, you know, so that's the, that's the kind of logic attached to this conversation. Okay, and uh, so what are the issues here? The issues here are basically that the set of limit cycle uh, states, uh, sigma determines basically all of the discussion from here on out. It dictates the measure. Uh, so an example of this is this deformed uh, limit cycle set that I've just mentioned to you. Um, it also allows us to consider on one footing, basically both unipartite and bipartite uh, limit cycles. There's no problem whatsoever. Unipartite and bipartite are simply subsystem statements and, and they're not particularly um, difficult to make. Um, also, it allows us to take into account marginal limit cycle states, as I will show you. And it also allows us to discuss coupled, uh, dissimilar coupled systems, which is, I think, uh, a great uh, um, uh, hope, basically, for us to make interesting uh, synchronization discussions in the future, right? And the final condition, uh, consistency condition that we always impose on ourselves in quantum information theory is that it has to match with existing measures wherever they exist. So all existing measures have to kind of lock, uh, we have to lock onto and show that they work so that you know we have consistency checks. Okay, so with that, let me just show you very quickly. Um, um, again, there's not much math uh, that I'm presenting now. I'm just going to give you the heuristic argument. Let me present to you how uh, basically the different measures go. So let's say that I have a unipartite system, right? So one quantum system, and I'm just driving it from the outside with a classical drive. So this is all that I'm discussing. 
Um, I, have a, uh, I have a limit cycle, which basically I define as a, a diagonal set of states. So some probability is QI times some states EJ, um, right? And so what I can then do is I can, compo I can compose what the relative entropy of synchronization is. It's, uh, uh, so the relative entropy with respect to the limit cycle set rho rho lim, you can show, this is just two lines of algebra you can show, is the, uh, is the, uh, is the uh, relative entropy of coherence plus the callback Leibler divergence. And of course, um, the relative entropy of coherence is defined here. It's the difference between the diagonal and the full uh, density matrix, uh, one Neumann uh, entropy of the density matrix. And of course, the central point here is that if you minimize uh, callback Leibler divergence, the minimum is found when P equals Q. So it just drops out. So uh, what you recover is a statement that we had proven in a paper with uh, 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 collaborators before in uh, this paper by Naufel and others, which was that the relative entropy of synchronization is nothing but the, uh, the, the relative entropy of coherence, basically. And so our measure basically captures one of the results that we had derived in a previous paper. Um, likewise, uh, what you can also show, instead if you compute the, uh, the trace distance uh, measure, is you can also show that the trace distance is upper bounded by the uh, uh, by the L1 norm of coherence, which is another statement that we had proven in the uh, in the previous paper. So these connect to basically well known information theoretic results from uh, from other papers. Okay, so let me also show you. This is a trivial calculation, a two line calculation, basically. Um, well, a one line calculation, which is uh, if I take the relative entropy with respect to the limit cycle set, which is the marginal limit cycle set. So if I say my underlying limit cycle, I define as the set of states that I get when I just take the marginal distribution, then basically I just get the mutual information measure. So the mutual information measure, which you had seen before, is simply a special case of this more general uh, definition that we've constructed. And uh, so in that as well, we make contact with all of the existing measures before. Um, one more uh, set of examples that I want to give you, which is um, if I basically have a bipartite quantum system, so this is not unipartite now, I have a bipartite quantum system and I want to calculate the, uh, the uh, relative entropy to the diagonal distribution. So I say that when I don't drive, this is entirely diagonal, then what I get is the, uh, is the, is the, uh, um, is the relative entropy of coherence, so the well-known uh, norm. But there is a small uh, addition of basically the classical mutual information. If I uh, say that I have two engines, which I'm, which I'm talking about, and when I don't couple them, the two engines actually don't talk to each other. So my diagonal limit cycle set is not a joint diagonal limit cycle set. It's actually delta A tensor delta B. If I have a tensor product structure underneath, which basically makes physical sense, if you have uncoupled quantum systems that you then couple, then uh, maybe this is the one that you would want to use. And if you use this one, then basically there is an additional classical mutual information theoretic contribution basically the, to, to the uh, relative entropy of coherence, which we proved basically. Okay. Um, the last example that I want to show you is a slightly, um, uh, is, a, is a kind of complex one. So imagine that I have uh, two engines or some applications that I'm discussing where I have a three level atom, but this is already being driven across two levels, right? So this is also being driven. So it's a non-equilibrium steady state basically um, because of some coherent uh, dynamics, it's already sitting there. Now what I want to do is I want to couple them and I want to study synchronization. I want to play the same game as before, I demand this. Now I ask you, how do you do this, right? And our answer basically was the following. We said, okay, so how does the underlying limit cycle look like? Before I applied the uh, yellow coupling, the underlying limit cycle was basically this top level was whatever level it was. And then I have some coherences in the, in the other two levels, right? So the three, two levels are basically, there's some coherence there. And so what we did was we basically uh, started with a diagonal distribution and we applied a unitary operator, which was basically just a rotation in a subspace. Right, um, and by constructing that set of limit cycle states, now so this sigma is now a set of limit cycle states. If I vary over all small u, and the u, I'm just giving you the representation of it, the Euler angle representation of it. We were basically able to construct uh, an analytic formula. It's in the paper. It's a slightly tedious formula, an analytic formula for exactly how to calculate the um, uh, the synchronization measure for this kind of a system. So partially coherent uh, uh, dynamics. Okay. Uh, and with that, let me just, uh, I think, get to the last example before I conclude, which is uh, what if I wanted to do a completely dissimilar system? So we wanted to show off that we could do something really crazy. So what we did was we basically um, started off with, uh, uh, with a Van der Poel oscillator. So which was the first part of the talk, if you remember, a quantum Van der Poel oscillator, a three level atom, which was the second part of the talk, and we coupled the both of them. 
So it's just a completely weird system that we've discovered. Don't ask me how to make one. This is just a mathematical exercise as of now, right? Uh, more physical examples will follow um, if, you, you know, if you want me to talk about them. And so what we did was each of those is basically a, 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 a nonlinear oscillator with well-established limit cycles, so on and so forth. And what we were able to do is we were able to actually construct the underlying uh, measure. And if you plot it, you can see an Arnold tongue. And so this is proof that indeed you can discuss the synchronization of completely dissimilar systems, a nonlinear Van der Poel oscillator, uh, infinite dimensional harmonic mode coupled to a three level atom, which is also another um, uh, nonlinear um, uh, oscillator, right? And so this is, the, uh, this is the exciting thing about it. And why would I be interested in this? So this is a diagram that I had made for a different paper, but I borrow it because it just makes the point, which is if I could imagine that I have many, many atoms sitting inside a cavity and the atoms have some internal structure, which is you know, desirable for whatever purposes. And I drive it from the outside. And by making the drive field nonlinear, by attributing some quantumness to the drive field and then making that drive field exciting, uh, interesting in some ways, uh, we could actually see synchronization dynamics in cavities that we've never seen before. And this would actually open up a huge class of other applications which, uh, which we're working on, which I think are, is very exciting. Okay, so with that, I'm just at the one hour mark. So let me present my conclusions. I uh, thank you very much for your questions and your patience. Um, so what we've presented here is basically a, um, a small discussion on quantum synchronization, which follows from the classical synchronization, um, you, um, you know, what we understand from classical synchronization. So uh, existing measures are very important lessons, but they're difficult to compute and they have small limitations, which I have uh, highlighted as far as I, uh, as I could. Um, so what we have presented here for you is a unified measure of quantum synchronization that reduces to all the known examples. So it's actually a good measure that captures all, all the stuff that we've known before. And uh, furthermore, it's easy to compute. There are tons of closed form formulas already in the paper uh, that I urge you to kind of look at and, and, and also deploy. Um, and uh, I think the favorite selling point for me is simply the fact that it's applicable to extremely dissimilar systems. So we can actually now go after synchronization, which is in the real world, um, atoms and cavities and so on and so forth, which I think is very exciting. Okay, so with that, let me just thank uh, um, uh, my collaborators in my group. So uh, Parvinder, um, uh, Solanki and Naufal are uh, basically on this paper and uh, they've been working with me. Uh, Naufal is just about to leave us. Um, and of course, uh, Samir was at an earlier paper. Uh, he's an undergraduate who's now moved on. Uh, and my collaborators, uh, Mikal, uh, who many of you know, uh, Professor Sarafazio and uh, Professor Quack, who are both uh, um, uh, long-term collaborators of mine. Okay, uh, so I thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. So here are some papers that basically directly refer to our work. Um, thanks very much, Sai, for the great talk. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we are more or less at the time, uh, like there were already a couple of questions very nicely woven into the talk, but is there any remaining questions still from, uh, from the audience? So, so I see still two maybe uh, remaining questions in the chat. And one is about uh, how nonlinear dissipators are realized in experiments. So if you know of some quick examples yeah, yeah. to give them. So uh, one of the famous ones is basically um, in Lee and Sadehpur and following them several people, including we made a suggestion, which is if you have a trapped ion system, then basically what you can do is you can do a two photon detuning. So instead of moving to the, uh, you know, so what you do is you typically have a ladder and then you have a ladder next door and you can address basically, you can lose phonons this way or this way. And so for instance, instead of losing phonons, basically that would make you drop in the ladder by one, you lose phonons in a way where you drop the ladder by two. So that would be an A square. Basically, so these implementations are both in Lee and Sadepur's paper, but also in my paper, which is cited here. Uh, we show exactly how to implement uh, a fairly complex scheme, and so this is one of the kind of typical ways that I would suggest, basically. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And the second question is from Ricardo. Uh, do you have an example of very dissimilar systems in the classical regime that may synchronize? I can not 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 off, not off the top of my head, but I can think because let me just say that um, uh, you can you can do fairly bizarre things like you know there are these uh, experiments with uh, uh, with chemical reactions. There are 
you know, um, there are experiments with capacitors and so on and so forth, and all of them are nonlinear oscillators. And so, and many of them put out basically uh, some signatures. So, for instance, they change color or they change opacity, which you can easily couple, basically. Now, naturally, I don't know. I would have to think, and this is a fair point. But in terms of engineering uh, applications, um, you know, in terms of engineering non-classical light, for instance, out of uh, these kinds of systems, I think my uh, uh, suggestion is perfectly fair. You know, but uh, I, I concede that I don't know a, a, a good example of an extremely dissimilar classical system that synchronizes right off the top of my head. Perhaps I should. Yeah. So there are two hands raised I see as well here, Nelly, if there is time. Yes. Uh, so maybe Taufik can go first and then Dominic. Uh, Taufik, if you would unmute yourself. Yes. You can... uh, OK, sorry. Yeah. So my question is, um, so as I see it, like uh, in, in the classical regime, when we see like a limit cycle, limit cycle or oscillation, there is an actual like physical observable that is oscillating. But mm -hmm. for example, in the example of Bruder, uh, where he defined uh, state one zero as a limit cycle, then uh, there's no observable that is like oscillating in that case. So I, I wonder whether this is a, a general kind of accepted definition of a limit cycle where uh, there is there could be no uh, observable that's oscillating, so it, it doesn't make any difference to any observable. What do it? I don't understand. Sorry, I don't understand the question, Taufik. Right. Uh, so, so in in the Bruder case, one uh -huh. zero is basically state one zero is basically. Uh, uh, it's a, a, limit it's a diagonal cycle, limit right? cycle state. Yes, yes. In in the Hussey Q representation. Yes. So, but but if I just stay in state. Oh, you're one, saying zero, what is oscill What is the free phase there? Which is the question you're asking. Yeah, the the free phase I can see it yes. in in the Hussey Q representation, but uh, in terms of observable, for example, like momentum or or any any observable like a Hamilton um, Hermitian observable. I, I don't see any oscillating behavior, right? Or... Yeah. So the free, so the the freedom, so the the free phase basically the way it exhibits itself is the fact that it's diagonal. So um and so the distribution is diagonal. So if you take any diagonal distribution, this is something that we showed as well in a previous paper. So um if you take any uh, if you take this three level atom and you put it in any diagonal distribution, that whole distribution basically has this free phase. And it has several free phases, but it definitely has one free phase. And the free phase is basically the fact that the coherences are not defined yet. And so the absence of the coherence being locked, localized, is the thing that is defined as synchronization. So I agree with you that this is, you know, you might say, this doesn't gel with my classical um, understanding mm -hmm. of synchronization. But yeah, this is the, this is the definition. Yeah, you could take a different definition, right? And in fact, this is something that mm -hmm. we're, we're writing about. You could take a different definition where you say, I want to see basically, I, I always want to see something oscillating and then you know you lock, you either lock them or you don't yeah. lock them in the classical mm -hmm. or the quantum regime. And this is a perfectly valid uh, point. Oh, so know, that uh, there exists like a different kind of definition uh, in the literature or not really? Not, not yet. We're I'm okay. talking about some paper that I'm writing right now, but yeah, not okay. yet, yes. Thank you. So let me let me stop myself from making comments. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, is it Dominic who had the? Yes. So Dominic, can uh, you you can ask your question? And I think. Yeah. So related to Tofik, uh, I wonder what is the definition of the limit cycle? Uh, is it the same as stationary state? Is it some solution to some equation? No. Um, so yeah. So the definition of uh, a limit cycle has to be uh, is the following, which is it has to be such that when you when you when you write the state so you always compute all of these quantities you compute for steady state right so driven or undriven you start the quantum system you draw you just let it you settle in its steady state and then you compute whatever you want to compute so what you do is in the undriven context when you take the steady state and you compute the um, the uh, husimi q representation function the argument is that the same phases that the hamiltonian moves, right? So this is the example that I had shown um, before. So maybe I can just go back to this um, uh, in a sec for a second. Uh, can all of you see my screen yet? So 
Sorry, my thing is misbehaving for some reason. Um, so the same phases that basically are moved by the free, yeah, so this, there it is. So, so what is the argument here? The argument is that you take the steady state and then you compute the Husini Q representation function. There are going to be angles that are determined and there are going to be angles that are free. What angles are free? The angles that are free have to make sense a la classical mechanics. What is that sense? The sense is that the Hamiltonian here is SZ. So the SZ, what is it going to do? Exactly like a pendulum that I, if I just leave alone, it just has this angle degree of freedom and it just keeps dancing up and down, up and down, up and down. This phase degree of freedom phi just keeps oscillating in a circle. Mm -hmm. That phase must be free, which means it is unlocked by the bare dynamics. And then you ap apply a driven dynamics or coupling that locks it. This is the definition. Mm. Okay. May I have a second one? Um, if, <laughs> well, if possible, can you type your question? Then we can have. Uh, um, okay. okay. We can go into like uh, so so that uh, Marty can set up his slides first. Um, okay. Can I stop sharing so that Marty can set up his slides? Yeah. yeah. That'll be great. Thanks. Okay. Take it away, Marty. So just to thank our thank speaker. You. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone. Very and nice. I can respond to the questions right here. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, um, let's move on in in the interest of time to the second speaker, um, 